You know, the old saying goes that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I'm willing to bet that there are some pretty entertaining stories behind each one of your family photos. I know that was the case for me. See, I grew up with a dad who absolutely loved his camera and with a brother who equally hated it. And so when it came time for our like, annual Christmas card photo, we just all knew we were in for a world of hurt, right? Especially me and my mom and my sister. We just knew it was going to be a rough day. So how it would normally go in our house is we would all get dressed up really nice, typically in some matching denim because I grew up in the 90s, <laughs> and we would head to some park somewhere, and my dad would pull out his tripod, and immediately my brother would start complaining. Right? Some of you have a kid, maybe some of you were this kid yourself. Right? My dad pulls out his tripod, and immediately my brother's saying, this is taking so long, it's too hot, Ryan won't stop touching me, and so on and so on and so on. And of course, you get a great example. I've got, this isn't matching denim. I'm sorry, we couldn't find that photo. We got a good family photo of the Cavender family here. So that will not be on social media, so take your pictures now if you want it. But the reality is, right, the time would come every December when my parents' friends would receive in the mail this Christmas card with a photo of what looked to be this joy-filled family sharing a nice day in matching denim at the park. But that wasn't the case, right? We all know that a picture-perfect family clearly doesn't exist. No matter what social media may tempt you into believing, there is no such thing as a picture-perfect family. We all have the same struggles. We all have that one brother. Maybe you're that brother yourself, right? And we all know what it's like to be in the middle of these moments. We all have our fair share of moments that are never going to make that family Christmas card. Well, today we're going to talk about those moments, those meltdown in the aisle of HEB moments, those you just caught your kid in the middle of a big lie moments, those emergency call in the middle of the night moments. These are those teaching moments that seem to never come at the right time, right? That never are going to make it into a picture frame, but yet they have the biggest impact on the lives of your children. It's those moments that we need to talk about. These are the moments we need to talk about because if we want to be these God-honoring, purpose-driven, and spiritually healthy families that we were designed to be, then family, we have to be more intentional in the way we discipline our children, in both how we prepare ourselves and how we respond to the ways in which they inevitably are going to wander. And here's why I believe it's so important that we address this topic head on this morning. Because it is in the discipline of our children that we have the greatest opportunity to share with them and to point them to Christ. Let me say that again. It is in the discipline of our children that we have the greatest opportunity to point them to Christ. To tell them who they are in Him. To train them to be like Him and to teach them how to walk in His ways. There is simply no more fertile ground to plant the seeds of the gospel into the lives of our children than in this one area of discipline. So we are going to address this head on this morning. But before we do that, I want to just take a minute to address two quick things. First, I know that there are some of you in here this morning who carry some past hurts from this area of discipline. And if that's you, I want to start just by saying I'm sorry. No child should ever be mistreated. And if you carry some of those hurts with you this morning, I pray that the Lord would continue to reveal more of his heart, more of his grace, his mercy, and his compassion for you. The second thing I want to address is that there is a spiritual battle being waged for the hearts of our children. I don't think any of you would deny that necessarily, but I think we need to understand that discipline falls into that category. Consider just for a moment whether you are deep into the parenting stages and your kids are maybe far gone and they're off living on their own with their kids of their own or if you've got little ones or maybe you're preparing for, for little ones. Consider for a moment the shame, the anxiety, the insecurity, and the inadequacy we all feel when it comes to the discipline of our kids. Once you realize that, you'll realize that the enemy is crippling families in this area of discipline. And worse yet, over the last few decades, he's really done an incredible job of pitting us against each other. 
right, in this jumbled mess of cultural expectations that are all meant to distract us from the biblical foundation in which we were designed to raise our families. So that is where I'm hoping to get us to today, back to the biblical foundation for godly discipline. Because I believe if we can get back to that place, we can take back our families and we can point them to Christ. Are you all ready to go on this journey this morning? All right, let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the ways that you have been shaping us and molding us throughout this Picture Perfect Family series. I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are here this morning. Lord, would you open their ears? Would you soften their hearts so that they might receive your truth and your wisdom? so that they might use it to direct their lives and to bring you glory. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to begin our journey this morning where we always do and where we always should, and that's with the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, go ahead and get those out. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Now, if you've been with us throughout this series, you know we spend time each week talking about some of the cultural expectations with some of these topics we've been discussing. Well, challenge when it comes to discipline is that the cultural expectations are all over the place. So we're not going to waste time talking about all the different parenting techniques, all the different styles and philosophies. Instead, we're just going to look to the wisdom of God and allow that to direct us. What better place to look for wisdom than in the book of Proverbs? So join me if you would. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. We're going to hear about God's discipline of us. It says, My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. And don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Now, what this Proverbs does is it it helps us understand a foundational truth, which is that God disciplines us. I know some of you are sitting here thinking like, yeah, I, I know that God disciplines us. I've experienced that. I've felt that for myself. Okay, well, what does that mean? It means that Godly discipline is not and cannot be evil that it is both necessary and it is good. Okay, so that's our foundational truth. We all on the same page so far? Okay, this proverb then goes on to point us to why God disciplines us. It says it's because he loves us, right? Because we are his children. He delights in us. And let's be honest, we all need it, right? None of us are perfect. So because of love and out of love, God disciplines us. And he does this in order that we might become who he has created us to be. And in this, he's given us a blueprint for how we are to disciple our children, how we are to follow suit. But let me be clear, it's not just in the the discipline of our children, it's also in the discipleship of others. You'll notice those words kind of share the same root. So if you are here this morning, and again, maybe you don't have kids, maybe those years are, are behind you of raising up young ones, maybe you're preparing for kids yourself, there is something for everybody in this message, because we're all called to be a part of the family of God. So let's talk about what this godly discipline looks like then. If you've ever experienced godly discipline, has that been a fun experience for you? (laughs) Has that been easy for you? No. But there's good news. So let's turn to the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look first at verse 7 and 8. It says this, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So the writer of Hebrews is taking that same Proverbs wisdom and saying, hey, if you have experienced this, that is a good thing. And then he points to why. Look at verse 11. It says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So after the writer of Hebrews says, hey, you're supposed to be experiencing this, he points us to why. He points us to the purpose, the purpose and the pain that almost always accompanies discipline. And I think what he does in in doing that is he really draws a fine line between discipline and punishment. I think it's where a lot of us get tripped up. So I want to just take a moment just to clarify the difference here between discipline and punishment. Discipline is training towards a goal. So a lot of you guys know that I'm a, I'm a runner and discipline is what it takes for me to get up early in the morning to get my miles and to put my body through some trials in order to reach the goal that I have in mind. It's not to say it doesn't hurt. It hurts pretty good. 
You know, it's not to say that it's, it's always going to be fun. It's not always fun. But it's done with a goal in mind. And the same can be said of God's discipline of us. It's not always fun. It's not always easy. Sometimes it just plain hurts. But it's done with the purpose of making us holy. Punishment, on the other hand, is inflicting suffering on someone for something that they've done. So it's reactive and not proactive. For those of you who played pretty much any other sport, this is what running was for you, right? It was your punishment. It wasn't necessarily a discipline. Punishment happens when we seek retribution, right? But discipline is what happens when we seek restoration. Punishment is, is law-oriented. Discipline is grace-oriented. And I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that, hey, we're not supposed to, to have any consequences for our kids. Consequences need to be there. They need to know that when you touch a stove, that's hot and it's going to burn you. Right? There, are, there are consequences to our actions, and those are important. But when those consequences are about inflicting suffering and not on pointing our kids to Christ, that's where we have the issue. Right? Our aim should be discipline and not punishment. And there's another reason I want to make this distinction for you this morning. Because I think oftentimes when we think of God's discipline of us, we can be tempted to think of it as punishment. Right, as like God's getting back at us for all of the ways that we have wronged him. But God's discipline is not a punishment for our sins. It never is. That was laid on Jesus on the cross. So what that means then is that all discipline from the Lord is only meant to, to, to draw us away from the things that can destroy us and to point us towards the only one who can save us. Some of you may be in a, a disciplinary season where you feel like God is disciplining you. That is a good thing. He is pointing you to Jesus. And what will happen if we learn to view God's discipline this way is we will no longer resent it. We'll no longer just sort of grudgingly accept it, but we'll learn to embrace it because we'll see it for its greater purpose of pointing us to Jesus. And so as we make a shift now and turn towards our discipline of those that God has entrusted to us, whether they are our biological children, our adopted children, or our spiritual children, this should be our posture as well. This is the biblical foundation. We are to model this same purposeful and life-giving discipline of the Lord. And thankfully, the Lord does not leave us to figure this out on our own. So there are many different passages we can look up for wisdom, but one of my favorites comes out of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. So if you would, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We are just going to study verse 4 this morning. Paul says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, let me give you a little bit of context. This is part of Paul's letter where he is addressing the entire family unit. So at the end of chapter 5, he addresses husbands and wives. Beginning of chapter 6, he talks about the responsibilities of the children. And then here he gets to the responsibility of the parents. Now, I know you're thinking, hey, that says fathers. It doesn't say parents. We don't have time to get into a Greek lesson here. But what Paul is saying here, the word that he uses that's translated here as fathers is speaking to those who are responsible for providing for and nourishing and raising up. So in other words, he, he is talking to all of us. This applies to all of us. Yes, it may be the Father's ultimate responsibility here, but the command that is given applies to both parents. So here's what this doesn't mean, right? It doesn't mean that, that the responsibility of raising our kids, it does not belong to the government. It does not belong to the schools. It is not even the primary responsibility of the church. It is the primary responsibility of the parents, right? Just like you guys saw here this morning. So let's talk about what this looks like then. When you look at that one verse from Paul, we can actually pull quite a few things out of it. So what I want to do this morning, if you're taking notes, I've got three simple, memorable ways for you to take this wisdom and to put it into practice in your parenting. You write down these three phrases. Write down, tell them, train them, and teach them. Tell them, train them, and teach them. This should be the focus of our discipline, to tell them who they are in Christ to train them to be like him and to teach them to walk in his ways. Tell them, train them, and teach them. Let's start with that first one. Let's talk about what it looks like to tell them who they are in Christ. Now, I find it interesting in this section of Paul's letter, he actually begins with a negative command. He says, parents, do not provoke your children to anger. If you look at the previous commandments or the previous things that, that Paul says to the Ephesian church, they're all positive commands. 
right? Things like submit, love, obey, honor. But then it comes to this really negative command and you have to ask yourself, okay, why would he say something like that? Why, why has he got to be so negative, right? But it's not because like the parents were bullying their kids or anything like that. It's because what Paul is warning parents of, what he's trying to help them see is that they need to be mindful of their actions, right? That parenting is not a choose your own adventure journey, right? Where you just sort of discipline based off of how you feel that day. And it's not a, a law of least effort thing either, where you just choose the path of least resistance. Because what both of those will do is they will provoke children to rebel and to reject authority. So Paul is waking us up here to the fact that there are consequences for us when it comes to a lack of intentionality in the way we discipline. So what are we to do then? Don't provoke our kids, but next thing he says, bring them up. Right, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We're going to set aside discipline and instruction just for a moment because I want to talk about what he means to bring them up. The Greek word he uses here is the Greek word ektrepho. And what it speaks to is this idea of provision and nourishment and care. He's implying that there is a, a deep connection here, which is necessary for us to be able to help our children reach their full maturity. In other words, family, we must be both present and active in the lives of our children, encouraging them out of that same place of love that, of which God disciplines us. And one of the best ways we can do this is through our words. It's not the only way, and I know for a lot of us, it's not the most natural way, but it is the best way that we can encourage our children, the best way we can tell them who they are in Christ. And in the same way we looked at the difference between discipline and punishment, I think we need to understand the difference between praise and encouragement. Right? See, praise is what's given in response to something that someone has done. It's like the positive side of punishment, right? But encouragement is, is tied only to who your child is. It is speaking to their identity in Christ. Praise is a reward for the good things that your child has done. Encouragement is a reminder of who they are because of what Christ has done. Do you see the difference? You can go ahead and praise your kids, right? I'm not saying not to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But just make sure you tell them who they are in Christ. Make sure you encourage them. Tell them they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Tell them that they have been made in God's image, that they have value, that they have been forgiven. Family, you got to tell them with your mouth, <laughs> both in demonstration and in proclamation. But don't stop there either. You've got to actually tell them what that means. I love that my kids are getting a little bit older now and they're able to wrap their mind around some of these things. It's changed the way that we have been encouraging our kids because we can make the spiritual practical for them. We can tell them what it means to be made in the image of God and why that matters. And what we're doing when we do that is we're ultimately counteracting the encouragement that they're receiving from the world. The world says, you can be who you want to be. And no, we're encouraging them by saying, you can be who God made you to be. See, this is a thing that I think a lot of parents fail to recognize, is that we as human beings, we all crave encouragement. It doesn't matter how old we are. We are all in the midst of an identity crisis. What we do is we go around in our day looking for encouragement wherever we can find it. It's a major reason why teenagers often get caught up in the wrong crowd, right? Because at least those people, those kids are providing encouragement. And even if it's misguided, even if it's flat out false, it still speaks to that child's inner need. It still speaks to them wanting to know, who am I? Why does that matter? And since nobody else is speaking that into their lives, what they're going to do is they're going to receive that as truth. So we can keep talking about this huge crisis that's facing our teens we can get upset at the schools and all the brands for pushing their agenda, or we can begin by taking the responsibility that we have as parents to encourage our kids and to speak truth into their lives so that they don't go looking for it elsewhere. It starts with us. It has to start with us. If we are not proactive and intentional in the way we bring our kids up, the world will gladly step in and take our place. We have to be intentional. We need to be the ones to tell them who they are. We need to be the ones to tell them who they are in Christ. And I want to pause just for a second to address why I think this is so hard for so many of us. 
because we have that challenge ourselves. Some of you grew up and you never had this person to speak this identity into your life. And so how are we supposed to do that for others? Let me encourage you, family. Take the time to understand who you have created to be. Once you understand your identity in Christ, that you have been fearfully and wonderfully made, that you have been forgiven, that you are a child of God, only then can you speak those same words of truth into the lives of your children. Tell your kids who they are in Christ. Next, train them to be like him. That's point number two for those of you taking notes this morning. The great Charles Spurgeon once said, train up your child in the way he should go, but be sure to go that way yourself. Therein lies the problem, right? That's the challenge with the discipline of our kids. It requires us to be disciplined first. This is why those, uh, those not so convenient, all too public disciplinary moments are always so doggone awful, right? Because they force us to be disciplined in the way we discipline our kids. They thrust us right into the middle of this triangle where we have what we want, we have what the world expects, and then we have what our kid needs. And what happens is because we are sinful creatures, we're normally going to give in to what we want or what the world expects, right? Whatever gets the kid to stop their crying, whatever gets the people at HEB to stop looking at me like I'm some kind of monster, right? <laughs> or whatever helps me continue to maintain the image I'm trying to project. But what true and godly discipline looks like is not focusing on what you want or what the world expects, but rather on what your child needs. And that's always going to be loving and engaging discipline. So I'm going to make the spiritual practical here for you, my church family, this morning by giving you a few ways that we can be disciplined ourselves in the discipline of our kids. Starting with number one, begin with boundaries. You've got to begin with boundaries. This is so foundational, and yet we so often forget to do it. I can't even tell you how many times I've gotten upset with Caleb and Avery over something I never put a boundary in place for. That is not fair to them. So why discipline has to begin with our own discipline. Are you setting clear boundaries? Are you actually communicating those in a way that makes sense to your kids? If we look to the Word of God, God lays pretty clear boundaries for us. He sets clear expectations. So there's really no excuse if we cross them. Got to begin with boundaries. But in the same way rules were made to be broken, boundaries are, me- are they're good, inevitably going to get crossed by our kids, right? And that's where we've got to make a decision how to handle that correction. This is where it's crucial that you know your kids. Right? The simple truth is that discipline comes in a variety of forms. And I'm sure every parent in here can attest to the fact that what works for one kid is not going to work for the other. Again, I'll use my own kids as an example. My sweet daughter, Avery Joy, has the worst FOMO you will ever see. Right? So when she gets in trouble, oftentimes we send her to her room. That, it makes a huge impact on her. It's often met with tears. It's this, 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 this moment where she has to come to the realization of what she's done. If I do that with Caleb, he's going to see it as a reward. He's going to go read books and play Legos for the rest of the day. <laughs> right? You've got to know your kids. You've got to be engaged with them. Understand what kind of discipline is going to speak to them. What's going to have the greatest impact on them. But regardless of what kind of approach you want to take, Remember the difference between punishment and discipline. The best consequences are always going to be the ones that point our kids back to Christ and back towards loving each other if they're siblings. That's a good one too. So begin with boundaries, know your kids, and next, be consistent. I can't tell you how many times I've heard parents use this phrase like picking your battles, right? You guys heard that? I've even heard that as like good advice from so-called experts. A lot of air quotes this morning. (laughs) <laughs> but I want to push back against that for a couple of reasons. First, using this battle analogy implies that there is a, a fight to be fought against our kids. There's a fight to be fought for our kids. It's not against them. But the second thing this implies is that we can just sort of randomly opt out of parenting when we just don't feel like it or when it's too hard. And I'm not saying you need to read your kids the riot act every time they step out of line. But to straight up ignore the responsibility we have to discipline and to disciple is to spiritually neglect our children. Like, I need you to realize that. To pick your battles 
And to ignore the opportunity for discipleship and for discipline is to spiritually neglect your child. And the sad thing is that this is actually what most parents are choosing to do these days. I saw a recent study from the Barna Group that found that 77% of parents subscribe to the pick your battles approach with their kids. Which means that 77% of parents are at times neglecting their responsibility and conceding authority to their children. And what happens then is this becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because what you do then by not having consistency is that you pit the parents and the kids against each other and it does become a battle. Right? This is why consistency is key. Why it's important to mean what you say and to say what you mean. Don't make empty threats. Follow through on the things you say you are going to do. And consider what happens when you don't. What does that communicate to your children? So we've talked about the importance of setting boundaries, of knowing your kids and being consistent. But the most important piece of practical advice I can give you when it comes to discipline is to make grace visible. To make grace visible. In the book Habits of the Household, author Justin Earley says, God's response to our misbehavior is to love us back into relationship no matter the personal cost to him. Let me say that again. God's response to our misbehavior is to love us back into relationship no matter the personal cost to him. What this means for us then is that the discipline of our kids gives us the greatest opportunity, the greatest chance to model the same kind of grace. Now, I can remember back when I first became a dad, all of a sudden you start to look at things a little bit differently. And so I start to watch a lot of the dads around me and the way they discipline their kids. So I watch some and they're a little more assertive. Some are a little bit more passive. Some I could tell, okay, they, they're, they're cool with spanking their kids. Others I could tell they're not. They're going to take a different approach. But the most impactful example I ever witnessed was my good friend Reuben. Now Reuben and his wife would probably fall into the more assertive category. And I had seen them, just witness them at, at, at some time spank their kids. And so I knew that was kind of the category that they fell in. But we were over at their house one night for, for life group and, and Reuben's son stepped out of line a little bit. And I saw Reuben kind of take him aside. And so I did what we all do. I kind of looked out of the corner of my eye to see how he was going to handle it, right? <laughs> and I saw him grab this little, little leather strip and I saw him prepare his son to be spanked. But then, out of nowhere, Reuben takes that himself. Then I see him get down face to face with his son and tell him how Christ takes on our punishment. I just remember being so blown away at the way this father made grace so visible to his son. Listen, y'all, this is the greatest opportunity we have and the discipline of our kids to point them to the grace that we have received from Christ. So when we do this, when we, when we set boundaries and we know our kids, right, when we're consistent, when we make grace visible to them, we're not just training up our children in the way that they should go, but we are going that way ourselves. That leads me to the third and final point this morning. After we tell them who they are in Christ, after we train them to be like him, we need to teach them to walk in his ways. This is what Paul is referring to as the instruction of the Lord. And what he's pointing us here to is the fact that we can't just encourage, we can't just discipline, we also need to be actively teaching them his ways. Not just putting them in Christian school, not just bringing them here on Sunday mornings, but by taking on the personal responsibility of both education and example in the ways of the Lord. I want you to think about it this way. Uh, back in the day when a young person was preparing to learn a trade, preparing to go into a, a certain profession, it was common for them to apprentice under a professional. So if you wanted to learn to become a blacksmith, you would go apprentice under a blacksmith. Or if you wanted to learn to be a carpenter, you'd go apprentice under a carpenter. Right? And you wouldn't just visit their shop for a couple of hours a day. No, you would actually move in with them. You would learn every single thing about the way that they lived. Because you weren't just learning a skill, you were learning a way of life, right? You were learning how they ordered their day. You were learning what things they prioritized and so on. And the same is true for us when it comes to the instruction of our kids. Yes, there needs to be a good, solid, biblical foundation, right? Bringing your kids here, sending them to summer camp, those are good things. But our kids also need to see every single day what it looks like to walk with Jesus. 
They need to learn that way of life. They are apprenticing under you whether you know it or not. See, they need to be fully immersed in the instruction of the Lord. That is the quickest way to learn anything. If you've ever learned a language, you know, right, if you go study or if you go live in a foreign country for three months, you can learn just as much of that language as you would in a classroom here in three years. The same thing applies to our walk with Christ. It's about both education and example. We must be fully immersed in the instruction of the Lord. So yes, bring your kids here for midweek. Bring them here on Sunday morning. Send them to back our Bible club. Send them to summer camp. Those are all good things. We will be as intentional as we possibly can with them. But the primary responsibility for both education and example, it lies with you. So as I invite the, the band back up and as I bring this message to a close, I want to ask you just a few questions, parents. How are you teaching your kids to walk in the way of the Lord? This isn't one of those questions where you're supposed to be like, yeah, I need to think about that. No, I actually want you to think about that. How are you teaching your kids to walk in the way of the Lord? How are you setting an example for them in the way you live your life? If you think of your kids as your apprentice, what kind of things are they learning about how to pursue the Lord? And third, how are you immersing your family in worship within the home? How are you immersing your family in worship within the home? These are the questions we need to think about as parents. This is what leads us to that place of intentionality and ensures that our kids will know what it looks like to walk with the Lord. Now, if this is something that you are struggling with, Maybe you've never had this modeled for you. I want to give you just a couple of simple suggestions. This is all overwhelming. Let me just give you two suggestions. Pray for your kids and pray with your kids. When you pray for your kids, what you're doing is you're acknowledging that God is the only one who can truly change their heart. Yes, there are things you can do. There are things you should do but he is the only one who can change their heart. When you pray for your kids, you're surrendering to the fact that all the wisdom in the world, all the good parenting books, all those Instagram influencers, none of that, none of that wisdom is going to change their heart. Only Jesus can. When you regularly pray for your kids, you are putting your dependency on him. When you pray, pray with your kids, what you're doing is you're setting an example for them. Right? You're showing them what it looks like to, to honor and to recognize authority. And you are showing them where your dependency lies. As they apprentice under you, they will learn to do the same. And lastly, by praying with your kids, you are introducing them to a relationship where you're not going to be the only one telling them. You're not going to be the only one training them or teaching them. Because you are inviting them into a relationship where the Holy Spirit is going to do that himself. Listen, family, we need to remember that there is a spiritual battle being waged for the hearts of our children. And the reality is the best way we can wage that war is to recognize the power of prayer and to press into it. So I realize this message is going to hit some of you in different ways. Some of you may leave here feeling motivated, energized, and hopeful for what the Lord has for you and for your family. But I realize others might be feeling some shame and some regret, maybe for some of the things that you have done. Whatever that is, I pray that it would drive you to a place of deeper dependency on God. Because he is the only one who can change your heart. He is the only one who can change the lives of your children. So in just a moment here, I'm going to pray to close out our time. And the band's going to lead us back into worship. If you're here and you feel like you need some prayer over this, I've invited Tammy and Ruth on our prayer team and a couple of our pastors to be in the back. They would love to pray over you as we close out our service. But if you would, all stand to your feet as I pray for us. Father God, we are humbled. Humbled to be your children, humbled to, to receive your discipline. And Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for the ways you discipline us. The ways you, you, you tell us who we are. The ways you train us to be more like Jesus. And the ways you teach us to walk in his ways. It's not easy. 
It's often painful, but it's made us who we are today. I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would continue to press into that in their own lives, in the lives of their families, so that we might become the God-honoring, purpose-driven, and spiritually healthy families you have created us to be. Oh, Lord, we love you and we trust you. We pray all these things in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen.